Amrit, it's great to have you back. We last spoke on episode 52 back in 2019. I guess we've both uh, got a little bit older then, a little bit wiser. Yes, I can't believe it. What episode are we now, Matthew? Well, we're going to be close to 260 by the time we release this one. And actually, since then, you've actually also gone off and you've been a host of your own podcast. Startup dads, yeah. So when I spoke to you last, I wasn't a dad. I did have a startup. And now I still have a startup, thankfully. uh, And I'm also a dad, thankfully. So yeah, Evie's downstairs today. Hopefully she doesn't uh, hear me recording and think she can come and bust bust in on this one, which is a, a signature move for her in the Startup Dads podcast. But it was more on trend for that one, wasn't it? Yeah, congratulations. It was a saying that if you want something done, give it to the busiest person you know. So not only did you uh, start a company and have a family, you decided just to host a podcast just for the fun of it and all that spare time you had. I don't know know how you do it. Good morning, good evening. Matthew Grant here. Now, we know you've got a lot of choices for podcasts these days. 500 million last time I looked. So I'm delighted you're asking us to join you for the next 30 minutes, whatever you're up to. This week, I'm joined by Amrit Santrasan, co-founder of HX, or Hyper Exponential, which was started back in 2017 in the UK. And we're delighted to be supported by Amrit and his team. The company's success follows a trend that we've been seeing over the last year of companies who were founded by people who got frustrated with a problem they had in their prior careers, often in insurance, and so they built a company to fix it. Amrit and co-founder Michael Johnson have clearly found a solution to their problem and other insurers' problem, given the growth in customers and partners that HX has had in the last few years. If you're interested in what we're doing at Instec and how much they'll help you find your solution or share your story, you can find out all the way up to www.instec.co or drop us an email, hello at instec.co. Now, back to Amrit. So, Hyper Exponential, you've been building uh, pricing decision intelligence platforms for insurers, HX Renew, I think it's called. And some of the largest names in insurance, I believe, are using the platform to build their pricing tools and decision workflows. And you're writing, or well, they're writing, over £22 billion of premium annually. Amrit, your CEO today. But interestingly, you started life as a software engineer and you trained as an actuary, you worked for an insurer, and then you built your business. So you clearly know what you're doing. You have had an $18 million funding round last year, and I believe you've now got over 100 people in the company. That's an impressive number of people. I know you've got an impressive set of clients there. You've got a lot going on. I'm not quite sure if this is the right question to ask you, but uh, what's keeping you busy right now? Yeah, I think it's one of those funny things as a founder. Everything keeps you busy all the time. When I spoke to you last, I think HX was much earlier in its journey. We've got a double-digit list of clients now. Some of the biggest, most significant insurers in the world use our platform. They're big enterprise clients with big enterprise demands. So balancing the needs of all of the clients, the work they need to support from the support from us to keep things going and um, keep them uh, moving as they kind of build out their decision intelligence engines, the product work that's required, and then balancing that with all of the new things that come our way. We're very fortunate to build a successful platform. You can do lots of things on platforms. So we've always got new opportunities. We're still at the very beginning of our journey, really, on terms of all the things we want to do to build the product out. The team is international now. We've got a team in Poland as well as London. So life as a CEO is very different when you've got 100 people as when the team is very small and all, you know, working and living in a co-located way. I'm a startup dad now, so I balance that with having a child who doesn't care at all that I'm the CEO of a startup. Uh, uh, she's got more important things for me to do. And it's a phrase that we've only coined recently. It's quite interesting. When we set up, I think, you know, people saw us as an insurance pricing actuarial modeling technology startup. And that's certainly a huge part of what we do. But one of the things that I saw when I was working in industry was you know, our clients, they have a ton of data, they've got lots of facts and information. And they've also got lots of insights. You know, I use these words precisely, they've got opinions and beliefs about the world. And they mix all of those things together to help them make decisions. The the price at which they set an insurance contract is a key decision. In our markets, typically, how much of a contract to take, whether to reinsure it, whether to accept it at all, these are all important decisions they make. And one of the things that I realized when I was working uh, in the industry is that actually pricing is a key part of that, but it's not all of it. And so the problem we solve, and we call it decision intelligence, is we help our clients wire together the data insights and the decisions in their kind of day-to-day life, such that actually when they go about their kind of their business, they get the decisions they make get better. 
And that's why it's not just insurance pricing. We call it decision intelligence for that reason. There's so much required to make a decision uh, in an insurance company. So much technology nowadays required to facilitate that. Our clients have huge enterprise technology landscapes. Their data, their users are distributed all over the world, all over the place. Plugging all of that in together to generate kind of high quality decisions is difficult. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to take away as much of the technology pain as is possible for them in doing that so they could focus on the actual insurance problems we have. So one of the kind of aphorisms that goes through HX is it's our job to take the tech risk away from our clients so they can focus on the insurance risk. And I just want to jump in there because you said something that sounded very intentional and also quite important. So you talked about underwriters having opinions, beliefs and insights. And can you just explain what that means, because it does sound quite important and even quite profound in how you're supporting people. It's a a great pickup that you had there, Matthew. So I'd say the key parts of actually making a decision for the purposes of underwriting, I'd say, are taking facts and information. We call that data for the most part. And then also opinions and beliefs, which we call insights. So particularly in the markets that we play in, there's a huge amount of information that's kind of instinctive and based in the underwriter's head. And they mix that often with much more factual information, right? So often the underwriters will have base rates and factors that they've accumulated through their time working in the market. And they'll also have data, the factual information. And actually, both of those things need to be mixed together to help make a great decision. It's very rarely just data. It's very rarely just gut instinct that makes a great decision. Yeah, it reinforces the fact that some of the early companies, I mean, coming back in about the time you started, felt they could displace the underwriters through technology. I'm not quite sure if any are still around or they are, they definitely pivoted. There's still a very critical role for the underwriter. Yeah, so for sure. So when I was working in industry, my job as an actuary was to spend time building really great mathematical models that helped underwriters make decisions. And then as the market moved away from spreadsheets and tried to make much more advanced technological systems to help us do our jobs better, I suddenly found myself spending a lot of time on things like database management and user audits and user control and all of these sorts of things. And suddenly I realized that the bits of the job that I went to actuary school for and that the underwriters and the executives in the company wanted me to spend my time on were taking up a a kind of decreasing amount of time of my day. And so the analogy I was saying is like we needed to get from A to B and actually in a car But instead of me getting to drive the car, I had to build the car. And that's not what anyone wanted me to spend my time on. When I had my job description, it said, you will become an expert in wiring technology together and administering databases. Essentially, in the way I understand it, is you're helping people, the underwriters who are basically paid to be underwriters, drive the car, not make the car. And the, the more effective you are at building the car for them, the less they have to fiddle around with it. it's a bit like actually in the way people used to drive cars back at the beginning of the the 20th century when you know it's a bit of adventure going out driving a car today you get in the car and you hopefully you, you drive 300 miles you don't need to touch it so is that, is that, that's kind of how the analogy works isn't it in terms of what you're doing yeah exactly right i think you know technology is supposed to be an enabler right that's the ultimate thing that i really believe and having been on the other side of the table you know it, the problem that we're solving today is as hx was is very interesting to me as an engineer but it was an inconvenience as an actuary. And I wanted the technology that, you know, I wish for technology it would be an enabler for my job. And you hit the nail on the head, right? There are hobbyists who love fixing cars, but you don't normally ask Lewis Hamilton to fix his own car, right? That's not something that you would do. And our professional underwriters, I don't think they want to spend that much time fixing the car. Now, I've been into the archives and I found our original recording, which is still out there, by the way. It's got like over 800 downloads. So I thought I just would play you a little bit of this because it's quite interesting. You're talking about the future, and this is in 2019. So let me just play this for you, and then I'm intrigued to know how was reality after this. So uh, so stand by whilst I just play you this excerpt from uh, our, our recording back in October 2019, it was. We've got a lot of innovation and experimentation that we want to do over the next year. HX has evolved a lot. You know, uh, we're absolutely very, very client focused and they've got some fantastic ideas. And that's actually the bit that really gets us out of bed is helping them do new things. Well, clearly you got you out of bed and got your team out of bed. But how did all that play out in the last few years? That's great. It's always fun to listen to yourself in the past. I think how optimistic and untired uh, I sound. I still am very optimistic, maybe a little bit more tired. Do you know, it's really interesting, right? And I think one of the things that you'll see when you build a startup, there's lots of in startup world talked about crossing the chasm. 
about the difference between the early adopters of your clients and the ones who come a little bit later, the late majority. And I think one of the things I've learned, certainly in the early stage of HX's life, people who were working with us were really those frontier companies who wanted to really kind of reimagine the way things were done. It's still very early days in the company in the company's life, and we still got very forward looking clients. What I find really interesting is in the really broad range of when I look at the market, right, not just our clients, but what I see in the market is in the breadth of kind of actually how technologically sophisticated our clients want to be. So there's a ton of innovation that we're working on, for sure. There's also a lot of really important fundamental kind of migration transformation work that has to be done, particularly for the really big clients. You know, these companies are cranking tens of billions of dollars of premium through their systems every year. It's not just a matter of kind of turning off the old system and turning it on. So lots of innovation, but some also some really foundational rebuilding work to do, which is interesting and kind of innovative in different ways, scary and fun in different ways. Maybe a little bit more tired, but still very optimistic, still lots of belief in the innovation in the market. Still lots of energy, I'd say. And hey, you, you survived and thrived and, and that you're part of a, a demographic of people who worked in the industry, had a problem went out and built something to fix it and grew a business on the back of it. So congratulations for that. Just want to talk a bit about Amri. You mentioned clients in there, and it's always a pleasure to know when companies' clients allow them to actually say who they are. But I know Inigo is one of your clients for a startup, although they're kind of probably close to $2 billion of capital now. But can you just talk a little bit about Inigo and why they decided to work with HX? Yeah, you're right. You know, I think we're funny when I, I think about us as a startup, but I think about some of the other companies that are called startups. We clearly have different volume definitions. Uh, Inigo, I think they chose us for lots of reasons. They wanted a kind of vendor that could mirror their kind of very kind of agile experimental as well as kind of i think like inigo combined like a really deep experience base with a very forward-thinking experimental mindset and i'd like wonderful deal to win because i think we've got lots of synergies in the way we go about our business together yeah they didn't want to worry about integrations being difficult i think you know the old days and i certainly remember this where you know as a purchaser of software i used to worry about how much each integration would cost rather than uh, you know uh, and how long it would take rather than just it being part of part of the course our products very easy to integrate into other technology stacks so yeah i think it was a meeting of minds our software was i think clearly the right tool for them but i think the company was the right partner for them too i, I really like that that comment you made about I think it's a bit more, there's a bit more to it than this, but that experimental mindset. I mean, essentially they were sort of intelligent experiments. Obviously that's, that's bearing out well for you, you and them. And then Convex, I know they're also another one of your, your clients, what you're doing with them. Convex has been an amazing journey for us. We started off with six people working in Southeast London and Convex, you know, saw the potential in our product when we were really a baby software company uh, and worked together as their company grew to the tremendous institution that it is today. You know, our software grew and the work that we did for them has grown and we provide the analytical kind of pricing infrastructure for their whole business now. So anything from their gigantic, very complicated reinsurance deals all the way down to the smaller marine and, and aviation risks that they underwrite. And we've been kind of with them since the very beginning. And that's been a wonderful journey. And they're a really good example of a client who push our, our product right to the limits. They've been one of our earliest clients. And they're in the situation now where actually they're pushing as hard, not just from the pricing point of view, but as I said, when it comes to decision intelligence, from making better use of your data to make better decisions more broadly. So they're at the kind of slightly more mature end of the spectrum of renew usage, where they've got a ton of data in the system. And they push us very hard to make it easier and better every day to help them use that data to feed back into that underwriting process. Now, actually, I was invited to a presentation at Convex about some of the lessons they'd found when they were exploring all the data they've got and how to connect it and the challenges. And it was actually, it was very insightful because they, you know, they're still an early company. We can talk about at what point you start calling yourself a startup. But yeah, even an early, early stage company that starts fresh still has challenges trying to connect data together. So I can see why there's such a big opportunity for what you're doing. And, and of course, your clients are not just in, in the UK, are they? You've also now expanded overseas. Yes, yeah, we're very fortunate to have won several of the largest pricing and analytics infrastructure projects in the world, actually. So we've got three very large clients in America, some clients in Europe as well, you know, putting a very significant amount of premium through our product. And, you know, London's the nexus of the insurance market. 
right? So if you build a good platform, all of a sudden you find yourself having opportunities to service the world's insurance market. And that's been wonderful for us to be able to do so early in our life. Yeah, and it really is because of the nature of the business coming to London. I mean, first of all, there's so much variety coming in. It's often quite difficult business to understand. It kind of pushes the, the, the underwriters and the pricing models and the data. So yeah, I've seen that in quite a few cases. If you can build an application for London, then it's this is a natural evolution moving out into the US. Well, but you've got to you've got to scale it more, and you, you've got to learn an entirely new language because they say things differently over in the US when it comes to insurance language. Great to hear you expanding over there. Uh, it might actually be interest to to know the UK body that that represents British trade in the US are avid listeners to the podcast, and I believe their actual understanding about what's happening in the space comes from the podcast. So if you're not already looking at working with that body to expand into the US, then uh, we should certainly be happy to introduce you to them, or they might even be in contact with you after this. So the the Instech podcast is uh, is sharing widely around the world. And, and that sort of brings us on to the next topic, which is partnering. I mean, I don't give praise lightly, but I say this quite truthfully, barely a day goes by without someone telling me they're... Uh, working with you or partnering with you so clearly when you talk about connecting the data and connecting the analytics something is happening in there but how do you think about those organizations out there are you sort of moving into a world of frenemies where sometimes you're cooperating and sometimes you're actually competing and and i'd love to learn a bit more about how that whole partnership concept is working it's wonderful that you hear that because we were very intentional about that from very early in our life so by design we wanted to say we wanted to be uh, you know this is something i say a lot i wanted hyper exponential and our platform to be the most versatile and integratable product out there because insurance is an inherently complex heterogeneous fragmented landscape if you think about the example i gave earlier where convex could be writing you know gigantic reinsurance deals and yachts or PB&P aeroplanes, you know, in two different parts of the same company. We needed to be very flexible and, and versatile in that regard. And we saw partners as a critical part of that. So we have this HX Connect initiative where we can work with anyone from the biggest insurance vendors in the world through to startups to make our product very, very quick and easy to integrate with them. We do work, collaborate with them to pre-build the, some of the integrations, to set the code base up, to give examples and put them into a very easy library for our clients to use to make it easier for everyone to integrate because I'm a big believer that we should make it easier to integrate, not more difficult. And that touches on the phrase you were saying, frenemies, which I think is really interesting. Lots of the business books I read, they use this word co-opetition, which always makes me smile. Any ecosystem, any marketplace and ecosystem and insurance is both of those things is going to have overlap. It's going to have overlap. You're always going to be providing software that sits at the margins, potentially in conflict with other people. But Actually, one of the things that we've seen, and I, this has been a really positive t- thing we've seen, I would say since the time that I spoke to you last, it's not just the new ones, you know, our friends at Cytora and Supersede that are obviously te- t- tend to be much more ecosystem minded because, you know, when you set up a business, you become, you, you start best of breed, whichever direction you go, you start best of breed. But we see the really big players as well, having really embraced a partnership and ecosystem mindset. And so I think the market more broadly has shifted to this worldview that we were kind of really wanting to espouse from the very beginning. And so it's nice that you hear that too, because we really, really believe in the power of a really strong uh, ecosystem that's well integrated. And just mentioning Saitora, we quick plug for both of us, actually, that we've got our event on the 19th of September uh, with Saitora and talking about the, the general theme there is is one we've been talking about as well, which is making underwriting lives easier. And we've got one of your colleagues represented on stage for that. So, I mean, we're already getting a lot of interest. So anybody who's listening and has not booked your seat, book now to uh, avoid disappointment. And and then one other thing, and I want to just come back to you on, which you mentioned to me before, it was really interesting on, the, on this topic of partnering, which was when you combine companies or, or technology that has a an efficiency, you get a multiplier when you combine the two together. So I think you used the example of, you know, if you had two organizations that produced technology that was 10 times faster, the combination was, was a multiplier, not additive. Can you just explain a little bit more about what you meant by that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, something I think a, a lot about, because, you know, when you set up a business, you get told very clearly by the market, by business books, by everyone that, you know, this kind of slight cliche that you need to be 10 times better 
right? You need to be 10 times better. So it needs to not be just slightly different, slightly more convenient. It needs to be discontinuously different, right? It needs to change the way people work. That kind of mindset is something that drives you to think about things in a new way when you build a product. And I think we've achieved that with Renew, people deploying building models in hours rather than months. And then we look at our partners who are achieving similar space things and, you know, take Saitora, right? So I think that the point I was trying to make when I was talking about this was actually if you make something 10 times better uh, and the output of that process feeds into another system that can be 10 times better, it's not just 20 times better, right? Each time you're putting something through the system, you can actually get gains that are far, far, far in excess of, of just yeah, 10 plus 10. It tends to be 10 times 10. And I think if you look at some of the use cases that you'll see that's published with Renew and our friends at Saitora and Superseed, that the, the efficiency gains are really quite extraordinary. And when you think about that, it shouldn't be surprising, uh, actually. If you can get the amount of time from months down to days for the purpose of building a pricing model, and each of those risks that can be priced inside a model can be got from months down to days, you really are compounding the impact in a way that's very, very significant. And it goes back to what you said right at the very beginning as well i think and uh about you know best about how you're just saving time and making life easier for the underwriters and uh, i want to talk a bit about scale and you mentioned a little bit about this earlier on in some numbers i, I quoted some numbers in the original introduction in one way is that, i guess to think about number of users and people that are actually getting their hands on the technology is that is that a sort of figure that you can able you've, you've got to hand in terms of how do you think about the growth of the business yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one. The nature of the market that we work in is it's typically, you know, very significant enterprise deployments of software that take time to sell, then deploy, then integrate and use. But, you know, the product is in the last few years has really faced very significant growth. Our biggest client is in the in the process right now of onboarding two and a half thousand users and $10 billion of premium onto the platform. So we're seeing very significant volumes of usage. And, you know, when you think about that amount of data, I, I think this is a testament to, you know, software. And of course, I'm a little bit biased to our software, which I think is great. It's got lots of work to do on it, but I think it's great. You know, I'm not sure how many pr- systems we saw which had $10 billion of premium on them in terms of the decisions being made in the previous era. And now a single client can be doing that in the space of 18 months to two years. So that gives you a sense of the scale. And, you know, if you think about us having du- double digit clients now, it's very significant usage on a daily basis. And yeah, it also means you know, if you personally, and that's just one client, there's two and a half thousand people that are coming into work and doing something that they wouldn't have been doing if you hadn't been around. And, and the reason they're doing it is presumably is better than whatever they're doing before. So you know, sometimes just bringing it down to the human level is another way of understanding the impact you can have with the business. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I tell the team, right, if you can make move the needle for them, you know, a half a point to two, two percent on the loss ratio for them, what's the impact you're having to that company's life? Yeah, it's huge. Absolutely huge. So I just want to change gear a little bit in just from your, with your technology hat on. We hear a lot about projects failing. We had some data recently from Cognizant about some research they've done that showed that over 80% of, of projects, not the ones they were involved in, but the research they did, people couldn't see the value of the project. We could have a whole podcast on why projects fail, but what would be a couple of examples in your experience where organizations have embarked on projects and some common themes about why things don't work out the way people felt they, they've got value out of them. Having worked in industry where I saw far more than what I felt should have been my fair share of failures, I was very motivated when I crossed the other side of the table as a technology vendor to try and really help our clients, you know, us not add to that list. I think this is actually not very complicated. I think the biggest reason by far why, that what I've seen is scope. Yeah, I think actually the scope can explain a huge amount of why projects fail. And I think, you know, I say this to my founder friends, right? Because when they ask me about technology projects and technology implementations, I think, you know, our clients, their primary job is to absorb risk from the world. That's why they exist. And so what they don't want is to have extra risk in technology on top of the insurance risk that they're absorbing. And that's what their shareholders pay them to do. And it's a really important thing that our clients are therefore very sensitive to the risk that's inherent in any big transformation project. And as I just said, you you think about that client that's putting two and a half thousand users and $10 billion of premium onto a new platform, right? The risk there can feel significant. And so one of the things that I think a huge amount about, and if you look at the market, and I think there's really good examples on all in all aspects of the market, it's where actually 
we try to have instead of an incremental innovation we go for like elephantine like transformation projects and the scope grows very quickly and jeff bezos from amazon is very famous for saying this there's no better way than to sacrifice quality than to broaden scope and it's something that is really i think about a huge amount because a good example i have when we think with our clients is i ask them to really think a little bit about whether they're building a bridge or whether they're building a network of roads what i mean by that is if you're building a bridge over a river the bridge has to work you can't just like start building the bridge and see what happens halfway through it right you know you can't have the cars driving and go oh you know nearly there nearly there's not just it's it's not great for a bridge but if you're building a network of roads you will have a sequence of roads going through a system and actually at any given time various states of the road network are in different parts of repair and rebuild and and new networks being added and in one of those areas you can be much more experimental i'm not saying we'd be experimental about road building but in the analogy right and in another area you can't be so experimental and pricing is a really good example where there are areas of a system like don't get me wrong you're not get you know your reinsurance pricing system just before you won once so that's probably not a network of roads but there's probably parts of your pricing system that actually are much more agile much more iterative if you make some changes if they don't work you can build something else and you can retire things and i think it's a big thing that i see when i look at projects you know f- f- mercifully and i you know i cross my fingers that we can keep this record up as long as possible you know we haven't had any of these failed deployments but the, the ones that we've been asked to come and pick the pieces up for and fix i see very c- clearly this phrase that i use which is yes 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 no right you broaden you keep saying yes the scope keeps going up until the very end it's no and i i always tell our team if you're going to say no say no nice and early so that's how I think about uh, managing success. Yeah, I think 90% of it is explainable by scope actually. That's so helpful Amrit. I mean there's so many things buzzing through my head. I mean one in particular you, you mentioned crossing the chasm which is of course is a Jeffrey Moore book which is well worth a read or actually a quick plug I did a short article on it. But but to your point there there's another excellent book that I'd recommend anybody read which is The Lean Startup which I'm sure you're familiar with by Eric Reese and he talks about very much if you're building a business or a product you, you need to start with your minimum viable proposition or your minimum viable product and and it's it's different because that's talking about a company building a product but i but i from the way you're describing it is very much true for big organizations as well and i guess if you're not going to build a bridge you're going to build a network of roads then as he said you just recognize you're going well i mean literally you're going on a different journey and i think the problem is sometimes it's too easy to start you know we're all used to just popping open a computer and writing something and deleting and spell check that there's, there's not that sort of thoughtfulness, as you said, about what is the project, what is the scope, what are the sort of redundancies built into that. So again, I think we could do another podcast on that whole topic about how to make your projects more resilient and, and yet don't, don't overscope them, say no early and uh, keep everyone happy with the final result. So I've got another question for you and you're not allowed to answer generative AI yet, but what trends or trends should we be looking out for over the next 12 months? you know the the ai one is obviously a huge one but you've told me specifically to not answer that i think the, you know the big one that's on my mind a wonderful job to sit at the intersection of insurance and technology and i think if you look at the technology markets in the last 12 months it's been brutal yeah absolutely brutal i think as we leave the zero interest rate era as the bubble on technology you know I, one of our investors spoke speaking to me probably 18 months ago he said um, this is either the second biggest technology bubble we've ever seen or the biggest right i think we're reasonably clear that it's up there now so i think we're going to see a significant consolidation of startups and technology in the space i think that's inevitable i think you're going to see lots of trade sales actually i think there are going to be smaller businesses that get absorbed into some of the um client bases you know on the trade side and that, that should be wonderful to, to to bring some kind of technology startup mindset into more established players i think you're also going to see market acquisition i think you're going to see the really big players in the market the established insurance vendors buying and consolidating some wonderful technology talent in that quite, couldn't quite make it for a variety of reasons so i think we're going to see that i think that's just if you want me to you know i'm an actuary so i very rarely i try to minimize the number of predictions i make in public right but i think that feels very inevitable you know, there's lots of businesses they're talking about the startup graveyard that's coming. Very few startups crash and burn. I think they'll move and transform and change shape. And I think that will be sad 
absolutely from the technology point of view but you know that technology will live on in various forms uh, and that will rejuvenate the market in different ways as i said i'm an optimist so that's a key one but no one should be surprised about consolidation in the market there's a big surge back in 2015 2016 i mean venture capital which is was funding a lot of those really big early companies they, their model is that they're going to win with one or two it's a poor, companies. It's a portfolio. They, they expect four or five of their companies to fail. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we see some of these companies failing. And I think that's why it's really intriguing to see what you've done. And, and I, yeah, I would say some of your peers in the market, and I think this is where Europe actually has got the edge over some of our friends in America, which is build the business, get a little bit slowly, get revenue coming in, and then go out and get your investment and, and be a little bit modest on your investment. So you're controlling the discussion then with your investors and you have, you've probably got more choice of investment. So uh, yeah, it is a trend and it'll, it'll play out in lots of different ways. Some will go under, some will get acquired, some will get accu hired. But it's the sort of inevitable, slightly Darwinian nature of the technology development. Although that might change in the future, but that's a different discussion about what the future of technology looks like. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to allow you to talk about generative AI now, and I'm going to frame it for you, though, for the person that is a bit sceptical around or a bit worried about the hype around chat GPT and generative AI, what, what would be your recommendations as to where there's some some places to go that are going to be um, worth looking at and beneficial? So firstly, I'd say I think the amazing thing about generative AI, and I think this is a testament to how fast technology is moving, is that we're really in the ni- 1996 internet era of generative AI, right? It's the very beginning of the very first innings of generative AI. And when you think about what it's capable really of today, and you think about that in the context of how much technological progress tends to advance as it goes through that S-curve of growth, I think we've got a tremendous amount more to learn about how generative AI will impact the world. But to answer your question to someone who's sceptical, I think generative AI can be used from so many different things, right? So if you think about generative AI in the conversational chat interface, which I think is what most people think a little bit about, here i'm assuming that not many of our insurance client friends are using it to create images of them as space warriors or something like that probably more focusing on the chat gpt style side of um is to be skeptical and to actually ask questions and if you're not sure challenge it and have a slightly maybe not adversarial but have a slightly debate-like attitude to use it i like to test it sometimes i ask it you know i'm a maths nerd right so the difference between a heavy tail and a fat tail distribution and then it comes up with something that i don't quite agree with and i tell it i'm an actuary and it goes oh sorry sorry actuary here's a different answer and i think one of the best things if you think about debate and conversation more broadly the best sorts of debates are where you kind of advance the surface of your own knowledge through really great conversation and i think i like to use generative ai that way that's the way that I found it to be tremendously useful. There's, you, one of the most powerful ways I use it is you can. there's loads of tools now. Chat PDF is a good example where you can upload PDFs and then ask it questions about a PDF. And I use it a huge amount for that. And I have the raw source material and I can ask it questions about the material and I can go and form my own opinion. And it's very smart. So it's not clear to me who wins the debate, but I certainly end up better, better off afterwards. You've been uh, rehearsing your prompt engineering, which is a career of the future, which is how you ask the right kind of questions. And you know, the exactly way you described it. If you tell it you're an actuary, it's going to come back and be a lot more careful. Though, well, of course, I mean, the thing about chat GPT specifically, and of course, there are other choices, and, and now we can pay for get chat GPT-4 or chat, chat GPT+. Plus. It does keep reminding us, it's, it's a little bit like, I'm not quite sure, a child or something. It's like, look, I've only got information that, that goes goes as far as 2021 so please don't ask me hard questions for anything that's happened in the last two years which is pretty extraordinary when given that you know we've only really heard about these tools in the last 12 months but i i was around you know back in the 90s when email first came out and the internet and it it, it is similar in the sense that email went from like nobody using it to almost overnight we all started using email you just get on with it and i think what's extraordinary about some of these things is we we do have to find our own use case for these tools and recognize the limitations, but there are, it's incredible. There are so many variations out there of what you can do. I mean, just back to your point about scope. I, I just for the fun of it last night, asked it to scope out a really simple little software program that I had in mind. Cause I was quite intrigued to see what would happen if I gave it sort of like three bullet points and it gave me two pages you could give to a developer to write a scope for a program. I mean, it was just really valuable because it knew better than I did what you should give someone to go and write a program in scope so all, i just think what you know point about i love that concept about you should expand your surface of knowledge because 
there are just so many different directions you can ask questions and learn in that are you know, well beyond the sort of the stories about students you know, getting their essays written by chat GPT. You're right. I mean, people use this phrase a lot, particularly in Silicon Valley, which is the technology simultaneously lowers the floor and raises the ceiling, right? Both of those things are tremendously useful in different walks of life. And that example you gave there is a really good example of yeah, lowering the floor to make, you know, you do things that you wouldn't have necessarily been able to do. And now that aspect can be passed on to someone. And yeah, you, that's the definition of zero to one, right? It wasn't possible before and now it is. Exactly. And, and actually, I had another great phrase which I, I was familiar with, but I hadn't heard it used in this context. In, in Google, they've actually got a verb, uh, and it's called dog fooding. And you probably know this from your own experience, with Amrit, but in Google, they, they, they literally talk about dog fooding their products. Did you do that at, at Hyper Exponential? Absolutely. I mean, you'll see some examples on our website of building election predictors and World Cup forecasters and all sorts of things. It's wonderful. That's one of the fun bits is when someone new joins, they build a model to do something fun with Renew. Because dog fooding comes from the concept of, I think, a company that actually was making dog food and the owner said it's so good you can eat it yourself. And that's kind of where that old term came exactly. from. Exactly. So when, when people join Hyper Exponential, you, ask, you give them a chance to create a product do they on hx renew is that how it works yeah exactly so we have a team of model developers they help our clients they build they, they test the product ourselves ourselves so they do the dog fooding of making sure that the product is exactly useful for our clients but they help our clients with deployments and they're a mixture of actuaries and data scientists and software engineers and so we go go build a renew model you don't have to build a property excess of loss pricing model you can build a renew model to do whatever you like it's decision intelligence who would you back for the ashes Right. Uh, maybe you don't need a decision intelligence model for that. But these are the sorts of things that require data and insights to make a decision. And so lots of that happens at HX on a regular basis. It's a really fun. We have our all hands meeting on a Friday every month and everyone brings their models that they've built. The new joiners bring their models and we all get to have a look at them. So, yeah, dog fooding, a key part of being a model developer at HX. Uh, brilliant. Well, I'd love to be a fly on the wall at one of your two meetings and see what people are bringing, that the project they brought along to show and tell I mean, it's, it's getting late in the day and really appreciated hearing everything I, i've got to ask you one thing though before you go i'll ask you two things actually but one, one thing i'd ask you is you know, we're really delighted to have your support at hyper exponential and we know, you know every every dollar or pound you spend when you're growing a business is really carefully thought about so I, i'd love to hear just what it was that gave you and your team the confidence to to keep supporting us at instack one of the things that i see in insurance is that the market is very big. There's partnerships and connection are so important, right? It's a big, fragmented, complicated market. And actually having the right relationships with the right people is really, really important. And Intertech does that, helps us do that really, really well. And being part of the community is really important. When I set up at, at HX at the beginning, I, I saw the power of community very, very clearly on the technology side. It's very popular to have coding communities in a variety of different places and they're very powerful high leverage things they're multipliers uh, and i think instech does something very similar uh, for the market in the way it brings people together so it was an easy decision uh, in the end really appreciate your support and I, I like a lot of great ceos and founders you're a great believer in giving back to the community and and helping the next generation uh, maybe they're going to be frenemies <laughs> maybe they'll be partners maybe they'll be clients but you know encouraging people to to start up their own businesses as i said I, getting towards the end uh, is there anything we haven't spoken about that you'd like to mention before we wrap things up? We've just done a big brand launch, brand refresh. We spent a lot of time thinking about pricing decision intelligence and how that differs from just insurance pricing and pricing systems. We really believe that this is the way the market should be thinking about how it makes better decisions. There's lots written on our website about that. We're going to be spending a lot of time on that, working with the market part. This podcast gave me the opportunity to talk a little bit about that. Check out our website. It's got some nice fancy new logos and color schemes, but it's also got much more important than that, kind of a little bit of a piece on pricing decision intelligence. And we hope that our clients, particularly on the kind of carrier side, but through the value insurance value chain, will find that useful. No, and I will put a link to, to you and to the website. And uh, your marketing colleagues will be, will be pleased to know that I've always been talking about hyper exponential with a lowercase h as we've been having our discussion, not with an uppercase h as occasionally happens in writing. No, thank you again for your support and, of course, all your colleagues as well on the marketing side uh, and the rest of your team who we know well. And uh, we look forward to seeing you and your team in, uh, in a couple of weeks back on stage again. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.